And the award for the most graceful YouTuber goes to... Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. Today I'm installing a Z-axis power feed on my Precision Matthews PM935 mill back here. I wasn't planning on making a video about this, but as I got into the project, things started going sideways and I decided it would be worth sharing the problems I encountered and how I solved them. Also, the instructions that came with the power feed are real bad. I know how much you love unboxing videos, so I made a point of leaving everything in the box exactly as it came so I could unbox it on camera. This is the Align branded power feed. This one came from Precision Matthews and it's brand new. It says it right here on the box. The Align branded power feeds are made in Taiwan, so I have reasonable expectations of quality, but let's take a look and see what's in the package. This is a rail for the end stops for the limit switch, and then it also comes with an extension shaft. The shaft that's in the mill isn't long enough to accept the gearing, so you have to put an extension on it. Comes with a bearing retention ring that's tapped to hold the motor, and the bevel gear has a little cover on it because it's pre-greased and you don't want that to get everywhere. Trust me, you don't want that to get everywhere. There's a package here with miscellaneous hardware. There's a bunch of arbor shims and spacers, the hardware for the limit switch, and this thing, which I think is a cast part that's meant to mount the switch, I never figured out what that was for. I didn't end up using it. It comes with a manual that is conveniently half in English, though it doesn't really matter. There's only one page in here with anything on it that's useful at all, and when I say useful, I am using the term loosely. We'll look at that a little closer in a bit. Now, as you can see, everything in here is packed really well. They're not using any foam. It's all cardboard cut and folded together to provide support and cushioning. If you've never used one of these before, there is a little bevel gear set that turns the shaft and this hangs over the shaft. We'll go ahead and get started on the assembly by putting on the knob. So the lever on a Z power feed extends out the front so you're pulling up and down rather than left and right. And one interesting trivia point, these aligned power feeds have a cover over the gear set on the bottom and there's a spare gear clipped in there. So if you ever strip it out, it comes with an extra one. I've got my coffee. Let's go over to the mill and get started. I had to provide the coffee myself. It wasn't included in the box. This is the knee crank on the mill. You can see it has a little castellated clutch here that allows you to take the handle on and off and move it into different positions. And then when I'm not using it, I always flip it around and turn the handle to the inside. And that keeps me from running into it, saves me a lot of bruises and a lot of messed up setups. First instruction in the manual says to remove the hand crank, dial, dial, socket, bearing, flange, end, etc. Which, trust me, is easier said than done. The castellated clutch nut just pulls off. You can see it has a keyway in it and there's a key in the shaft. That's what transmits the torque of the crank to the actual elevating shaft that drives the elevating screw. That keyway is a key feature that we will not be able to use moving forward. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Take off the adjusting nut and the vernier dial. And the part underneath here serves two purposes. It has the raceway for the dial to run on and it also clamps the inner bearing race to keep everything in position. This part is threaded onto the shaft and it is tight. I chewed up the part with vice grips and all kinds of different tools trying to get it off. I could not get it off. And then my friend Yuchul Kim showed me a photo of this part on a bridge port and it has a hole for a hook spanner. So you can just put the hook spanner in there, give it a tap with a mallet, and it will just come loose. Now, of course, this part is smooth and doesn't have a hole, but I have a drill motor and I have drills. So I just grabbed a drill and put a hole in the part. Uh, the part is cast iron, so it drills really, really easily. I was surprised at how easily it cut, and now I have a hole for a hook spanner. It's still really, really tight and I needed something for leverage. So I went ahead and put the keyway back in, I put the clutch back in so that I could use the crank to apply leverage. So it's just a simple matter of putting the hook spanner on here, getting the crank into a convenient position so that I can brace it and then grabbing a brass hammer. A couple of taps 
and it just popped right off. And when I say taps, uh, it took some pretty good thwacks to get it loose. But now that it's loose, it will just come off with finger pressure. Let me take this key out. It's really easy to lose. I don't think we actually need it, but uh, I'll hang on to it in case I ever want to put the mill back into its original configuration. You can see that just threads right onto the shaft and the shiny surface there bears against the inside bearing race and holds everything in position. We won't need this, but I will put it away just in case I want to put the mill back to its original configuration. I always save this stuff and throw it in the box even though I know I'm never going to need to do that. Now the outer bearing race is retained by this retaining ring and it's just held in with three socket head cap screws. They're stuck pretty well also, but I think it's mostly just paint and body filler. And with that off, you can see the little raised ledge that holds the outer bearing race, and you can see the bearing. The power feed kit comes with this replacement outer bearing retainer, the difference being that it has a couple of threaded holes in it for mounting the motor. It is a tight fit. I think mostly it's just interfering with the paint, and the screw holes almost line up. In fact, they're close enough. I've seen other people who've mounted power feeds on their mill and found that the screw holes just were not on the right diameter circle. These are close and they're close enough. I was able to get the screws started and there is just enough clearance in the holes and in the counter bores to get them in without, you know, bending or jamming or cross threading everything. So I think I got away with it. But if they were any further off, I would have had to remachine the part. Step two in the instructions says to install the extension shaft. That seems pretty easy. It just screws on. It has threads and it bears against the inner bearing race, just like the part we took off. And then it has a key in the outside. Note that there's no key on the inside. I do want this as tight as I can get it, so I set the Z-axis locks to provide some resistance, and I'm just getting this as tight as I can by hand. Now with that tight, I can actually turn it in either direction to raise or lower the knee, and I'll just turn it so that the keyway is up just to make my job easier. Step three, tighten stand to flange, then tighten knee feet on the flange, which I think means mount the motor. Important for angular positioning, apparently. There is a roller bearing in the center here that rides on a bearing race on the extension shaft and that just keeps everything aligned and takes up the side to side forces caused by the bevel gears. There are a couple of screws included in the kit to mount the motor to the ring and we'll just go ahead and screw those in. And unfortunately, the screws provided in the kit are too long. They're actually going all the way through the ring and bottoming on the casting and the motor is still loose. Even with those screws as tight as they will get, it's still not held in position. So I think the solution is gonna be some washers. I think there is enough head clearance in here for washers. I went through my hardware stash and found a couple that will fit, and we can try this again. And with the washer under the head, it is bottoming on the head and it is clamping the motor in position. So that is gonna work. I did go back through the hardware that came with the kit to see if maybe there were some washers and I just missed it or the manual just didn't mention them, but nope, there aren't. But as far as oversights go, missing a couple washers is minor compared to what I've run into on previous projects like this. Step four, install gear key knot in. Use hand to push and turn bevel gear to check backlash. If necessary, add a few shims to obtain proper backlash. This is where things can get messy. I'll pull the cap off here and you can see that the gear is pre-greased. So this stuff is insidious. It gets on everything it touches. I can press the gear all the way up here and then just sort of feel the gear mesh. The grease makes it a little bit tough, but I'm just feeling to see if it's bouncing over the gear teeth or if it's meshing cleanly. And it's definitely bouncing over the gear teeth, so we need some shims. I'll just sort through, grab the thickest shim in the kit, and try that. There really isn't a good way to measure this. You really have to just do it by trial and error. So I'll kind of get a feel for this, try to work some of the grease out of the teeth so I can feel how much mesh is really there. Grab another shim, try again, grab another shim, try again. And there comes a point at which you can no longer feel and hear the teeth bouncing over one another. 
you add another shim and then you can sort of feel that it's gotten a little bit too loose and then you can just take shims out one by one and work it back in until you feel like you've got the gear mesh that you want it shouldn't be binding at all it should turn nice and free with minimal noise and maximum smoothness and i think that's what we've got here step five remove bevel gear after step four is okay and i think step four is okay then reinstall the key replace the gear install the dial tighten the dial nut and shim the dial as needed go ahead and put the key back in here and replace the gear over the key and this will lock the bevel gear to the extension shaft but keep in mind that extension shaft is still just threaded onto the mill shaft underneath and sure enough, the dial is making contact with the body. So we'll go ahead and stack up some shims in here and we'll just play exactly the same game. Just keep stacking up shims until we have enough clearance that the dial runs freely, but there isn't excess space that, you know, dirt and grime and chips can get in behind the dial. That seems about right to me. So we'll go ahead and continue with the assembly. You really want to be sure you have this shimmed properly here before you continue, because once you get the castellated clutch nut on the outside, it's really difficult to take it apart to adjust the shims. And I actually did have to take it back apart and adjust the shims, but uh, I won't bore you with that process. Now with the nut on there, I'll go ahead and tighten this down. Now we don't really have anything to bear against, so I'll put it in gear. That'll provide some resistance and I'll kind of bang on the shaft and get it tight. And that is tight enough to run it up and down. Now keep in mind, we're still not keyed or pinned to the inner shaft. It's just the tension on two sets of screw threads that are actually holding it all together. I'll plug it in and we'll give it its first test run. And mostly here, I'm just trying to find out if everything is moving freely, see if the motor seems like it's straining, see if I hear anything scraping or binding. And this seems pretty good. Check the limit switches and just make sure everything's wired in the correct direction. So it's going up. If I hit the top switch, it stops. And then I should be able to reverse off of the top switch. Same thing with the bottom, it stops in the downward direction, but I should be able to reverse off of it. If I can, that all looks good. Cool. This mill has a nice convenient little space here to mount the rail for the limit switch. It's actually parallel to the movement of the knee, so I'm not going to have to do any shimming. I should be able to screw the rail directly to the frame. I'll just get it lined up here and use a piece of blue tape to hold it in place. At least I'm going to try. I guess there's enough oil in the paint that the tape really isn't sticking very well. But that's okay. I'll just hold this in place and use a transfer punch to mark where I want to drill the holes. This doesn't need to be super accurate. It doesn't need to be super parallel. This is not a DRO. We don't have to align it with the dial indicator. It just needs to be in the right place so the switches will hit the stops. I'm going to mount this with M4 screws, so I'll just go ahead and drill with the tap size for M4. And then come back with a hand tap wrench and tap the holes. Sometimes, just for variety, when I'm installing something like this, I try to break off a piece of tap in the mill just as a souvenir of the process, but I decided not to do that today. The rail just mounts with a couple of M4 screws. It actually has holes already drilled in it, so I didn't have to do any of that. And once again, since this is not a DRO, there's not a reed head, there's no reason to indicate this in. To get the switches in the correct position, I just made a 3 quarter inch thick spacer out of a piece of aluminum, just drilled a couple of holes in it, and I'll use the same method with transfer punches to mark where the holes need to go. Free tip for the day, if your stool has wheels, keep an eye on it. It's just a matter of time before it betrays you. I'm using M6 screws to mount the switches here. Technically the slots are large enough for M8 or maybe even M10, but I think M6 is plenty. 
and it's easier to find a place to put a couple of M6 screws in the casting without hitting any of the internal mechanisms or oil passages than it is with a bigger screw. I spent a bunch of time with my head under this mill looking up inside the knee casting trying to make sure I wasn't going to hit anything critical and I don't think I hit anything critical. The switches were kind of hard to hold in position with one hand so I opted to just drill and tap one of the holes and then use the part to locate the other one with a screw in the one already tapped hole. I didn't have any screws the right length, so I've ordered what I need, but in the meantime, I'm using some extra long flathead screws with a big stack of washers to mount this just so that I can test today. Yeah, it looks like my lubrication pump is leaking here. I need to do something about that. To test, I'll bring the stops in close so we don't have to run the full stroke of the knee in order to test. And that's the lower switch working. Let's try the upper switch. And that's working, and we can back off of it. I, of course, still need to adjust the stops so they're in the correct position to stop the knee just before it hits the end of travel on the top and bottom, and I'll do that off camera. There's no reason you need to watch me fiddle with that. Step six says to install the check clutch against the bevel gear and then drive through one hole of five millimeter diameter for the pin. There's a pin that goes through this, and that's ultimately what secures everything to the mill shaft. Without that, it's just held on by the threads. And it does call out that you do need to make sure you've got everything shimmed exactly the way you want it, because once this pin goes in, that's really the point of no return. And uh, it does suggest that you might want to install the hand crank rotating clockwise direction to heck for proper shimming. And I think that's an excellent idea. The pin goes through this shoulder on the castle nut here, and that takes it through both the extension shaft and the inner shaft. I could just bring in the drill and try to do this freehand, but there's no way I would get it straight through, and there's no way I would get it to exit in the middle of that shoulder on the other side. So what I need is a drill guide, and fortunately, I have a 3D printer, or two, or three. I sketched up a quick drill guide in Fusion 360 and printed it out in PLA. This is a one-time use item, so this should be plenty durable. I went ahead and printed this with a raft just so the Z dimensions would be accurate, but it probably doesn't really matter that much. But it was just one click and it gets you a nice clean print. The hole in this is 4.85 millimeters, which should be just about the right size for a pilot drill so we can come back later and ream it. The drill guide has a shoulder to locate it in the correct position on the nut with the hole centered in that shoulder. And so it just registers and the V groove lines it up so it'll be exactly on center. There are probably lots of ways to hold this on while I drill, but I'm just going to use an automotive hose clamp. So this just came from an auto parts store. This happens to be stainless steel, but it doesn't really matter because it's not going to be here for very long. Just snug that down, not so tight that it distorts it, but tight enough to hold it in position. And then I am going to come in with a transfer punch and create a center mark in here just to try to keep the drill from wandering away as I start drilling. This is a 135 degree split point drill, so it should do a good job of biting into the material and going in easily. It should take a little bit less pressure than a typical 118 degree drill would, and we'll just run it through. Now the plastic is melting from the heat and the hole is getting larger, but I'm using it as a visual aid to just keep the drill centered and keep the drill perpendicular to the workpiece. And that seems to be going okay. We'll be able to tell here in a minute. That drill was the imperial equivalent of about 4.85 millimeters and we'll follow it up here with a 5 millimeter reamer to bring the hole to size. That goes through nice and easy. Let's take this apart and see what we got. You can see this did not fare very well. The holes are much larger, the plastic's melted, but like I said, it's fine. It's a one-time use fixture and it already served its purpose. If we rotate this around, you can see the entry hole is right in the middle of the shoulder and so is the exit hole. Not bad for a 3D printed drill guide. There are some burrs on the exit hole, so I'll just use a needle file and clean those up. And then we should be ready to put in the pin. This is just a spring pin that came in the kit, 
and I'll just tap it into the hole and drive it down flush with a punch. And that will do. It'll always be possible to take this out with a punch later, but for now this is a at least semi-permanent assembly. And this should keep it from unscrewing because this is pinned all the way through to the shaft in the mill. Now we just need to install the handle and the handle goes on with a spring and a washer. Unlike the way it was set up originally where the handle was just hanging there, it's set up here with a spring to keep it disengaged because when you reach down or when you're running the power feed, you don't want that handle to be whipping around and hitting people and things. So this will allow it to run without the handle clutch engaged, but you can still push it in to operate it by hand. Yeah, that's a little fiddly and tight. I might clean some of those teeth up with a file or we'll just see how it wears in. For now, I think that is gonna be good enough. This is, in the end, a simple project. If you can make heads or tails of the instructions and work through the inevitable challenges. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up, feel free to subscribe, and maybe consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. Patrons can download files for all of my projects, including the 3D printed drill guide I made for this one. I also post Patreon lens clips while I'm working so you can get a little sneak peek behind the scenes. Thank you for watching.